How many of you know that the next four to six weeks are going to be the most stretched out, stressed out time of year? Um, now, the media now, with their, the media mongols and the consumer uh, police and all of them are going to do everything in their power to inform you that you can buy your happiness. Uh, you, it, it's just, it's just going to blitz you everywhere you turn and everybody's smiling. Just watch when you see everybody on the commercials. Now, they're all smiling. They got all their bags when they're in the stores and everything. And, they, they, and, it's, and it's giving you the euphoria that you can buy your happiness. And that the more stuff you buy, the happier you'll be. But they're trying to convince you to spend money you don't have, to buy things you don't need, to convince people you don't like, to like you and for you to think that you're happy uh, and, and then on top of that it, it's just trying to muffle all the real stuff that's going on right I mean as, as you turn on your TV you know you, you got the war in Ukraine and, and between Ukraine and Russia and between Israel and Hamas you got that going on then you got all the political ads they're sneaking in you know the political unrest that we have and, and, and then on top of that you talk about all the economic woes and uh, you know all the financial stress that we're under and that's not including our own personal problems you, you, you know we got our own pain and our own suffering both personally and professionally right and, and on top of all of that is trying to make you think that you can just buy your way out of your pain and suffering but, but you know, it, it, that's not how it can really happen because your problems are real wouldn't you say your problems are real the issues are real Right. And so so as we as believers, we're not ignoring that the problems are real. We're acknowledging that our God is real. You see, you see, so 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 for the next four to, to six weeks, I, I, I want us to really focus on God being real, because when we when we change our focus, uh, then we can change our actions in how we respond to our problems. Not that your problems going to go away. I'm, I don't have the magic bullet uh, to make your problems go away, but I do have the right sauce. All right. To help you be able to get through your problems. And, and, and so as as we go, let me slow down I'm getting excited um, and I get to preach for three hours because I miss three Sundays I'm <laughs> three or four Sundays I get to get all my time back and plus y'all got an extra hour of sleep that's why some of you are late this morning I ain't calling no names brother McGee I ain't, oh, 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 I, I, <laughs> uh, mm. but, but, but let me give you something that will cost you a whole lot la less and will last you a whole lot longer. If you would open your Bibles uh, to the book of Psalm. Uh, and uh, for those who have your electronic devices, I want to encourage you to tap the app. Uh, and if you've got our app, again, as it says, absolutely free. <clears throat> and tap the bottom right hand corner where it says worship and go to sermon notes. And hit today's date, November 5th, and we're going to see a foolish invitation to praise. And for the whole month, we're going to walk through this whole passage of uh, Psalm 96. So you can read it, and I want you to read it every day, okay? Uh, and we're going to look at only today the first three verses because it really sets us up for worship. These first three verses are about our ability and, and how we ought to worship and how we as those who believe in God ought to uh, carry out our worship. And so I want to talk about a foolish invitation. I really want to change it to a foolish command because uh, it's more than an invitation. It's really a command or foolish instructions uh, uh, to, to praise. Um, but uh, let's look at verses one through three, and I'll come uh, from the NIV. And the beautiful thing about our app, you, you got Bible uh, part in there. You can pick up different translations and things of that nature. And you can also keep up with the notes here uh, as we go. All right, so what did I say? Psalm 96, uh, verses one through three. Uh, listen to the word of the Lord. Sing to the Lord. You know what it says? Listen to this, a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. 
proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations. Isn't that what it says? Yeah. His marvelous deeds among all peoples. Uh, now, 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 to understand this text, we have to understand its context. There's a lot of theological debate uh, about who wrote the psalm. But I want to just first, before I say that, tell you about the book of Psalms in its entirety. It's 150 of them. And, and these psalms are written by uh, real people who had real life going on. Uh, you can really call it soul music, all right? Because it's music for your soul. Uh, it's people who've had problems. It's people who've had pain. It's people who've been through uh, suffering. It's people who've faced death of their children. It's people who've faced loss of job. It's people who've been persecuted. It's people who've been in bondage. It's people who have been sick. These aren't people who have been sitting in ivory towers talking about how good life is. No, these are people like you and I who can identify with life. Now, this 96th Psalm here uh, was believed to have been written by David, and then some say maybe by a scribe. And the reason there's a lot of theological debate is because I believe the first 12 or 13 verses mirror one of David's Psalms found in the book of Chronicles. But when you look at the last part of the verses there, they talk about a different historical period in the life of Israel. And, and for that reason, that historical period is about five or 600 years after David wrote the first part. And so what we're actually looking at, this is a remix. How many of you ever, you know, got songs that's been remixed? See, y'all think remixing is new. That's nothing new. It's been going on a long time. It's like, it's like uh, Stephanie and the band, you know, remixing something. Say, oh, man, that sounds good, but I heard part of that before. You know how you heard part of that, but then you hear a new part, then you hear an old part? What this is here is a remix. All right, this song here is a remix, and, and the writer uh, is writing about a time after they got back out of being in bondage. Anybody ever been in bondage? About anything, you could be in bondage with drugs, you could have been in bondage in a relationship, you could have been in bondage in a job, you could just, your mind could just be all wrapped up and mixed up, but then once you get free, the writer says, sing, sing. Yeah, now, now, now this word sing here uh, is a command. This, this, he's not giving a suggestion. He's, he's not telling you, think about singing. No, he, he gives a command, and he gives us, he uses this word over and over. And I want to give you a definition of what sing means. It means to use your voice as a vocal and verbal instrument filled, that is filled with gladness. It didn't say I had to be on key, Stephanie. It says a vocal and verbal, I didn't mean to call you out. <laughs> it means a vocal and verbal instrument that is filled with gladness, right? Yes, indeed. It, it doesn't say anywhere on there that I need to be on key. It just says that's what singing is, all right? And, and, and it's a command. He, he is commanding us. And notice now, that word is also in the plural. Now watch this. Listen very carefully. So this isn't just for the choir, all right? Uh, he's talking to everybody who knows the Lord. He's saying that we all ought to be singing. So when Doc and the choir comes up here, they're not here performing for you. They're here to lead you in worship and so that you should be singing along with them using your vocal and your verbal. And we all ought to be singing those songs because we got something and someone to sing about and something to sing for. He, he's saying now, sing, that's a command. And he's going to use that word several times in just these three verses. He's trying to drive home a point here of what we need to be doing and especially when you've been through something. And when you've been through something or going through something, every now and then your problems can become heavy. But if you just start singing, yeah. you just start singing a song. Now, if you just start, he didn't say you had to be on key. He says it's verbal and a vocal instrument filled with gladness. Just, that you're not glad about your circumstances. You're just glad who's in your circumstances with you. You know that he he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He says, I'll always be there with you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. He says, sing. 
but, but he didn't give us the object of who we're supposed to sing to yet, did he? That word sing, that's just what it means to sing. And, and, but he says, sing to the Lord. Yeah, yeah, because see, some of us are singing joyously, vocally, and verbally, right? And we are filled with joy. Uh, can I just talk plain? Everybody knows how to worship. It's just who and what you worship. Have you ever noticed when you're watching a sports, professional sports on TV, how everybody's in worship mode? They're already in, I mean, you know, the 80,000 people. And do you know they don't leave in an hour? In fact, they take about three or four hours to get ready. They have pregame. Right? They have tailgate. That's called small groups. They get in small groups. They get in their small groups, right? Then they spend time doing communion over and over and over. Right? Huh? And by the time they get into the arena, they're ready to go. Why is it that we come here expecting something to be done to us and for us, but when they come, they come ready to worship? He's saying, sing. Ouch. All right, he said, sing a new song. Now, he, he says, sing to the who? The Lord, not to your favorite football team, not to your favorite basketball team, not to your favorite mall, not to your favorite car, because some things we can get real excited about. Your new hairdo? <laughs> Woo! He says, to the Lord. Now, notice he didn't say to God. Because, you know, everybody, you know, they're okay with God. Have you ever noticed most folks don't have a problem when you say, uh, you know, that anything about God? But when you start saying the Lord, that's his personal name. He, we're talking about a specific God. Uh, we're, we're not just talking about any God. We're not talking about the God of basketball, the God of football. We're not talking about the, the God of your job or your God of your, uh, uh, of, your, of your desires. No, we're talking about the God who made the heavens and the earth. Uh, we're talking about the one who caused night to become day. Uh, you're talking about the God who placed the stars in the sky and named each and every one of them. We're talking about the God who made you and whose image you've been made in. He says, sing to that one. But notice now what he says, sing. He says, sing a new song. But we just already said that this is an old song. How can it be a new song if it's an old song? That word new means a fresh revelation. When you've had a fresh revelation about something, have you ever read the Bible? Some of you, have you ever read it? Anything? Anybody ever read anything out of it? But have you ever read a passage before? And you say, wait a minute, I read that before. But, but I didn't see that. I think they'd be sneaking new words in there, you know, and new understanding and new meaning. But then you'll see something that you didn't see before. That's a new revelation. That, that's a fresh revelation. When you see something you haven't seen before, that you learned something about God you didn't know before. When God has done something for you before that he hadn't done before, you got a new song. You got a new reason to praise God because he's done something fresh. Our songs ought to be rich and robust. They don't need to be weak and wilted. We don't need to You are my worship. My worship is real. You know my worship. Has God done anything for anybody in here? I, I mean, like I just said, if, if, if you just recognize, do you know that he didn't have to wake you up this morning? Sometimes, you know, we get all excited about the big thing, but when you can just tie your shoes. Huh? I, I, I'm telling you, y'all. I, I mean, because, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I like being independent. Yeah. No, I ain't going there. But, 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 but just to be able to tie my own shoes. That's a new thing. I got something to sing about today. Just, just, just a... Yeah. 
Notice what he says next now. Sing to the Lord all the earth. So not only should you have a new song, but the song should be universal. It's not just germane to Jews at this time it was written or to us at First Baptist or to those across the street or even across the town. No, this is all over the world. All of us can sing to the Lord. Don't you know when you read Revelation 7, 9, it talks about how when we get there, all the different tribes and tongues and nations are going to be there singing before the Lord. Why? Because he created us all. And so all of us ought to be able to to sing a new song. So let me give you first power in praise here. I believe I said it right, power in praise. Yes, those who know the Lord should have a new song. Should have a new song. And we're going to dig deeper on that as we walk here through that next verse. So look what it says next. It says, sing to the Lord, praise his name, right? I believe that's what it says, right? Praise his name. Wait a minute. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Now, this word praise, again, is talking about worship. It, again, doesn't tell you who to worship. It just talks about worship in and of itself. When you praise something, you're worshiping something. You, you, you're worshiping something or someone. And he says, praise his name. Now, why his name? Why didn't he just say praise the Lord again? Well, because when you use someone's name, it's the same thing as calling that person who they are. You know, when you hear somebody's name, Right, you don't you think about who they are the minute you hear it. You think about their character, their their, their behavior, uh, what's good about them, what's bad about them. For instance, if I were to say the name Stafford, for those of us who know the Staffords, we know that carries weight, right? If I say the name Biden, how many have heard that name before? Right, you think of who? Y- y'all do know who he is. Don't you? <laughs> well, what about this one? What if I say the name Trump? See, see it, it, it evokes some kind of emotion, some kind of knowledge. Well, see, when you sing now, what it's talking about is that your head knowledge, right, is going to give you your heartfelt emotion. And so now he's saying, take your head knowledge and your heartfelt emotion and you give that praise to his name, to the character of God, to the God who has all power, to the God who knows everything, to, to the God who's loving, to the God who's faithful, to the God who who's long suffering that is you praise his name because of who he is sometimes we praise him for what he's done no he's just talking about praise God for who he is that he is God and he's God all by himself he can do whatever he wants however he wants whenever he wants to whomever he wants he is God and he doesn't need anybody else and because he is God I want to praise him I want to give him all the praise and all the honor and all the glory praise his name And he goes on to tell us how to praise his name. He says, proclaim, proclaim. Again, that's a joyful uh, 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 speaking of outward uh, public profession. It's saying it out loud. In other words, we're not secret agents. Not being afraid. To tell people, look what it says, proclaim his salvation. When we see that word, we often just think of our being delivered uh, from death by our salvation in Jesus Christ. But that word means to be relieved or removed from imminent danger. It means that God has kept something from you or or kept you from something or someone or somebody. He he has delivered you in such a way you know it was nobody but God. Have you ever noticed something's happened in your life and you know that it was nobody but God. It was nobody that could do that but him. And and he that that knows the way has to be big things. Sometimes it's just little things. You know, I just marvel at how God just does things, right? And I got to just tell you, can I talk to you plain? I I only got another hour and a half. (laughs) Last week, many of you may not know, but I wasn't here last week and for a very good reason. Uh, But one of the reasons is I was flying to uh, Norfolk, Virginia to meet Sister Redry, who had driven up to see her mother, who we were celebrating her becoming 94 years old. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. 
And I wasn't able to go with her, but so, you know, I, 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 I call myself, I'm going to slip up there and surprise her, but that's a whole other story. But so I was going to fly up, and, and, and I did. And, and I got on the plane and everything, and, and I was sitting in my seat, and I, you know, and it was those two, you know, we only had two seats on each side of the aisle. And, and I'm already thinking uh, about, you know, how I'm going to strike up a conversation with the person. You know, I'm already getting myself in witness mode, right? <laughs> Because I'm not a secret agent, you know. But my son is always telling me, Dad, keep your head down. Don't say anything to anybody. <laughs> Stop talking to folks, Dad. Just keep, come on, come on. You know, we, 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 but that's a whole other story, too. But, but anyway, but anyway, 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 anyway. So I was sitting down on the plane, and people were coming in, and people were coming in, and people were coming in. And then uh, this sizable person. <laughs> sizable person sat down next to me, and, 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 and I got a seat so my arm could be on the inside, because, you know, if it's on the outside, I was afraid that, you know, fo folks bumping, and it was still kind of tender. And, and, and so the sizable person sat next to me, and I tried to lean, and it seemed like the more I leaned, the more size he got. So now I stopped thinking about witnessing. <laughs> and I started praying for relief. <laughs> I, I mean, it's just, it's just the way it was, right? And, and you know, and I'm, I'm leaning in it, and it seemed like, hmm. And I'm going, hmm. Now this shoulder's out and out. And I'm going like, wait, man, I ain't got but one good shoulder. And you know, the, 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 and the students come out, sir, you gotta lean in. I'm trying. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, you know, I got a problem right here. And then he, then he, then he went on to say, I'm gonna need a belt extension. Wow. Yes, yeah, so, so yes, yeah, so I'm like, mm, this ain't gonna be good. And so now, the thankful thing was, it wasn't a long flight, but we, ain't, but we hadn't left ground yet, and I'm, I'm in pain. Yeah, and so I said, mm. so then that, I heard the announcement, and this plane was full, it was full, y'all. And I heard the announcement, you know how the cabin come on, the, everyone is on the flight now, the door is closed, please take your seat so we can get ready to take off. And I'm going like, ooh, okay, here it goes, this is it. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And so then I spotted a vacant seat, one row up. I'm thinking like, okay, now I got to find the students because you just can't move, you know, in a seat. You got to get permission. But then I look, it's going to put my bad arm, surgically repaired arm, to the outside. I'm going like, okay, so do you want to take a chance on the pain you don't know or keep the pain you do know? <laughs> you know, I'm in a dilemma here. I, I, I'm trying to figure this out. So I'm still praying. Now, I forgot all about witness, and I'm just sorry, y'all. I'm just like, Lord, 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 help me, help me. What am I going to do? I say, okay, Lord, if this is it, I'm just going to take the pain, and what am I going to say? I, all right, I'll figure this out. I'll figure this out. And then he said, is that C vacant right there? I'm like, uh -huh. He said, sir, let me buy. I'm going to go up there and sit next to my wife so your arm could breathe and you won't be in pain. I'm telling you, God takes care. When I say he takes care of the little things, it talks about being delivered from intimate danger. He's saying now that you just got to praise him for the little things. There was no way I could have made that happen. There's no way I could write that script. The man said, I thought this plane was full. I said, I did too. <laughs> but there was a seat right next to his wife. And I'm saying, why you didn't sit there in the first place? <laughs> no, I did. I said that to myself, because I told you he was a sizable guy. <laughs> now, it would be different if I had both my hands. <laughs> oh, wow, I'm only halfway through. <laughs> So let me give you some power and praise. It's good to share the good news every day. 
Notice the last part of that text. It says, proclaim his salvation day after day. All right? Sing that new song. It's, it's never old. God is always doing something new. You just have to look for it. You just have to recognize it. And it's saying that we ought to be the ones. Now watch. He just wraps it up. He goes on and gives us another command because the, the, the command to sing is a command. The word sing is a command. The word praise is a command. And now he gives us another command. He says declare. Declare. This word here means to tell someone, to tell it, to tell it out. He's saying declare his glory. Now, what is God's glory? We, we talk about it all the time. It talks about, I'm going to use a short term, his, his being a heavyweight, meaning he's the biggest, he's the baddest, he's the best. And, and so you're going to declare that God is the biggest, he's the baddest, and he's the best. And, and when you declare his glory among the nation, he's not talking about almost all what you say here. The this first part is talking about how you live. See, sometimes what we, what we do speaks so loud that people can't hear what we say. You don't need to sometimes tell somebody you're a Christian. If you have to tell them that sometimes, you might need to ask the question, why did I have to tell them? They should be asking you, are you a Christian? Not, I thought you were one. But are you one? And he's talking about now how we live among the world. That word nations in the, in, the, in the Greek would be the same as Gentiles or heathens or unbelievers. He's talking about how we live among unbelievers. If we're going to declare that he's the biggest, that he's the baddest and he's the best, then we ought to live like he's the biggest, he's the baddest and he's the best. We ought to be able to tell our problems about our God, how good our God is. We ought to be able to tell others what God has done for us. We ought to live a life that's pure and holy and profound and such a way that people know that there's something different about you that even when things are falling apart that you're not just losing your mind and you're just not going crazy yes I watch the news and yes those things are real and I know there are real problems and I know that there are real lives being lost but one thing I also know that God is still on the throne and because he is the biggest and he is the baddest and he is the best I know that everything works to together for good for those who love the Lord and a call according to his purpose. I don't know what God is doing in Israel and Hamas. I don't know what he's doing with Ukraine and Russia. I don't know what he's doing in the White House with the Democrats, the Republicans, and the Independents. I don't know what he's doing up on Wall Street with the market going up and the market going down. But what I do know, that he is still God. And because he is still God, I can worship him each and every day. I can praise him by the way I live, not by what I say. That I, can, that I can walk around and, and not look all sad and confused and, oh, it's so bad. We don't know what's going to happen. And, 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 and this is happening and that is happening. And I'm going like, eh? The Bible's already said there'd be wars and rumors of wars and, and before the end comes. So why are you all, ex all upset and concerned about it? He's, the scriptures are just being profound feel before our very eyes. So I can keep living as though there is a God because there is a God and he's the biggest, he's the baddest, and he's the best. So after I live that way, then he says, declare his marvelous deeds among the people. Now I can tell somebody about how good my God is. I can tell everybody what my God has done. I can tell them how he had Noah build an ark and save his whole family. So if you build an ark, you can save your whole family. I can tell him how he sent Moses to tell Pharaoh to let my people go and how he did it with such power and such courage. Didn't have an army. Pharaoh 
Pharaoh had the biggest army in the world, but Moses went in with just a stick and said, that my God said, let my people go. Don't you know that if you know him, you can tell him like Joshua, you can just walk around your problem. You may have to walk one time. You may have to walk two times. You may have to walk three times, but you can just walk around your problem and just know that sooner or later, God can bring those walls down and you can just tell him that he is Jehovah Jireh, the God who will provide. He's Jehovah Nisi, the God who will fight your battle. You can just tell everybody who he is. You can tell him. You can tell him. You can tell him how great he is and that he can do things that nobody else can do. He can cause a woman to be pregnant without a man. He can cause his son to come down 42 long generations. He can cause the blind to see, the lame to walk, the deaf to hear. He can even raise the dead. But even himself, he can be crucified between two thieves. He can be pierced in his side. He can hang his head and he can die. But that's not how the story ends. That's that's not how it is, because in three days, three days, three days, he got up, he got up, he got up. And if he can kick death's butt, I can say that, Canaan. That's not what I want to say, but that's what I'm going to say. Because y'all would leave me if I said anything else. then what problem do you have that your God can't take care of? So in this season, don't get caught up in all of this commercialism. Don't get caught up in all of this foolishness of how you can buy your happiness and have happiness. You just continue to praise him and let your worship be for real. And, and, and let me give you a third point here because this is, this is your power in praise. Your praise should be local and global, whether it's right next door or whether it's across the sea. You'll be able to tell folks you're about what God can do and what God has done. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'll get my other hours back next week if the Lord allows. Let me give you some takeaways. Let me give you some takeaways. Your worship is owed to the Lord. It's owed to him. And you and it should be directed to him. Not to anyone else or anything else. Your worship should be glad and openly expressed to the Lord. And your worship should declare the Lord's glory to all people at all times. Stephen, I want you to go back and I want us to stand. We're going to sing. Come on up, Doc. We're going to sing by worship. It's for real. And I'm going to give you your bottom line. Real worshipers express real praise vocally and verbally and this isn't for the choir to lead you each of us if you know who he is ought to be singing this if God has done anything for you and sometimes we often live on our grandparents and our parents and somebody else's faith but you ought to have your own story by now You ought to be able to stand on your feet. Come on, stand on your feet. Because some of you have been through some things. Your problems are real. Your situation is real. But so is your God. And when you recognize that your God is real and that he's the biggest and the baddest and he's the best, then you can say, God, I don't know what you're doing in this situation right now. I, I don't know why I have to go through what I'm going through right now. But because you are God, I'm 
going to worship you, Lord. I, I, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I'm going to worship you because you've been too good. When I look back from where you brought me from, has he brought you anybody from anywhere? Has he delivered you from anything? Well, when you just look back, sometimes you just have to look back in order to see forward. Come on, Doc. Bring them on. Y'all sing this with them now, Nick. My worship, my worship.